Wormwood, everything is clearly going very well. I'm especially glad to hear that the two new friends have introduced him to their whole group. All these, as I find from the records office, are thoroughly reliable people. Steady, consistent scoffers and worldlings who, without any spectacular crimes, are progressing quietly and comfortably towards our father's house. You speak of them being great laughers. I hope this does not mean that you think that laughter as such is always profitable to our cause. The point is worth some attention. I divide the causes of human laughter into joy, fun, the joke proper, and flippancy. You will see the first among friends and lovers reunited by a holiday. Among adults, some pretext in the way of jokes is usually provided, but the ease with which such small and unfunny jokes produce huge amounts of laughter shows that they are not the true cause. What the true cause is, we do not know. Something like it is expressed in the detestable art form which the humans call music. And something like it occurs in heaven, a meaningless acceleration of the celestial rhythm which is quite opaque to us. Laughter of this kind does us no good and should always be discouraged. And besides, the whole phenomenon is disgusting and is a direct insult to the realism, dignity, and austerity of hell. Fun is closely related to joy, a sort of emotional froth arising from the play instinct. It is very little use to us. It may sometimes be used, of course, to divert humans from something else which the enemy wishes them to be doing or feeling. However, in itself it has wholly undesirable tendencies. It tends to encourage in people charity and courage and contentment and many other evils. The joke proper, which works by exploiting subtle inconsistencies, is a much more promising field. I'm not speaking here of indecent or crude humor, which, though much relied on by second-rate tempters, is often very disappointing in its results. The truth is, the humans are pretty clearly divided into two classes on this matter. For some, there is no passion so serious as lust, and an indecent story ceases to produce lasciviousness the moment it becomes funny. For others, laughter and lust are produced in the same moment and by the same things. The first sort joke about sex because it gives rise to many incongruities. The second sort, cultivate incongruities as a pretext for talking about sex. If your man is of the first kind, crude humor will not help you. I will never forget countless tedious hours I spent with an early patient in bars and smoking rooms before I learned this rule. Find out which group your man belongs to, and make sure that he does not find out. The real use of jokes and humor are in quite a different direction, and they are especially promising in people like your patient, who take their sense of humor so seriously that a deficiency in this sense is almost the only deficiency for which they feel shame. Humor is the all-consoling and, listen, all-excusing grace of life. So, it is invaluable as a means of destroying shame. If a man simply lets other people pay for him, then he is mean. But if he boasts about it playfully and needles his friends for having taken advantage of them, then he is a comical fellow. Mere cowardice is shameful, but cowardice boasted of with humorous exaggeration and grotesque gestures can be passed off as funny. Cruelty is shameful, unless the cruelty can be passed off as a practical joke. A thousand crude or even blasphemous jokes do not help towards someone's damnation nearly as much as their discovery that they can do anything they want to do, not only without the disapproval of their friends, but with their admiration, if only that thing can be treated as a joke. And this temptation can be almost entirely hidden from your patient by that seriousness about humor. Any suggestion that there is too much of it can be seen as puritanical, or as a lack of humor. But flippancy is the best of all. In the first place, it is very economical. Only a very clever human can make a real joke about virtue, or indeed anything at all. But any of them can be trained to speak as though virtue were funny. Among the flippant, the joke is assumed to have been made. None of them make it, but every serious subject is discussed as though they've found a ridiculous side to it. If prolonged, the habit of flippancy builds up around a person the greatest armor plating against the enemy that I know, and it comes with none of the dangers inherent in the other sources of laughter. It is a thousand miles away from joy, it deadens rather than sharpening the intellect, and it excites no affection among those who practice it. 